Welcome, mindsetters, to the session of grade. Exciting. <laughs> exciting. Come on, time. Exciting. I should have seen that one coming. Okay, I should have seen that exciting. one. Exciting. <laughs> ah! But it is. We're doing a lot of interesting stuff. I always have fun. I always have fun in your shows. I See? know you do, darling. Mm. Oh, he's so, so sweet, hey? <laughs> So mindset is, I hope you guys are ready. Make sure you got your pens and pads out and you're about to make notes because you need to listen to this awesome lady because she's going to be teaching you what you need to know. So, Kathy, I what hope, are we going to be doing? <laughs> Whatever you guys want. And apparently the first question is all about primates and how we are similar to primates, which I think is a good question because it's something I would ask if I was setting your test. Okay, right. so can so we... So while she okay. goes over there, guys, make sure, make sure you know the drill. You get on the page, you get chatting to me, www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra. I'm so always excited, excited, excited. Yes, Kathy, I'm excited to make sure to see you guys on the page. So get chatting, get chatting, get chatting, and then you guys can win this awesome, awesome prize, guys, because I'm giving away these, these winter school books, and they are awesome. And I'm not just giving away just for life science. I'm giving away for maths. I'm giving away for, for like all of the subjects that you need and accounting. So guys, and geography. So make sure... <laughs> I've got my producer in my ear, so she's telling me everything. She's awesome like that. Well, I was going <laughs> to tell you now as well to remind the kids about accounting <laughs> and geography uh -huh. and English. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And all those good subjects. Yeah. And yes, while I continue wrapping this up, make sure, make sure, guys, you get on the page and get chatting to us. And guys, call in, call in. You can see the number because it's going to be put down on the banner just below me. And make sure you call in so you can get one of these awesome books. And I'm not going to keep quiet because Kathy needs a lesson to teach. There you go. Cool. Well. <laughs> all right. Excitement. Um, what, we, what was asked was the characteristics that we share with primates. Okay, now, before we do that, I need for you to just have a, a, a little look at this. Okay, this is called a phylo, and my pen is on a mission, a phylogenetic tree. Phylo from the phylum, the, the grouping, the kingdom, the blah, 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 all of that, okay, and it's a genetic tree. And this thing is something that they could give you and say, ask you questions about it. Now, a Maya is a million years, okay, and they're saying, right, if we look here, we started off with Hominodia. They split, and we ended up with yet another split. This one ends up giving us our orangutans. This, so it tells you that your orangutan isn't even as closely related to uh, uh, gorillas and chimpanzees and humans. That we are closer to chimps than we are to gorillas or than we are to orangutans. You follow? And if we look here, we're looking at six million years ago that this little splitty thing happened. Okay, so if it did, this is a theory. No one is saying that you're a baboon. All right, so people, that's very important. These are theories. So then we say, okay, well, cool. We have a, we, we, we figure all of this and we've got four million years that it took and six million years ago. But look at this. We've got a gene, a key gene sequence. Okay, and if you look at our chromosomes, we have how many chromosomes? Please tell me you're going to get this right. We have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. I have them, you have them, Ty has them, everyone has them if you're a human being. Okay? Um, if we were re closely related to primates, uh, there would be a, a, a lot of because we're looking at subfamilies then, then we should have approximately 97% of shared DNA. Uh, we don't. We don't. Okay, something else is that if we look at the modern human genome, which is the genetic makeup inside humans, all right, and the chimps, we only have 70% shared DNA. No, I mean, that, that shared DNA would be uh, have a jaw, have body made of bone, uh, have skin on hands, have little pinkies, uh, have eyes and nose and mouth. Um, all those things that, that shared. We share it with snakes as well, for heaven's sake. So people, don't get all excited about this. Just take it from where it comes. It's a theory, okay? 
Also, if we look at our DNA and the segments are analyzed and compared, the genetic sequence divergence varies incredibly between your humans and your, and, and your chimps. Okay, remember something else. We have 20, they have 24 pairs of chromosomes. We have 23. And a Down syndrome child has 23 and a half or 47. So they've got 48 chromosomes. We've got 46. And a Down syndrome child's got 47. You can't play with, with chromosomes. You can't say, well, okay, well, they got 48, we got 46. It's so close. Yeah, it is so close, but it's so different too. So please don't get your things all messed up and say, oh, we aren't, I refuse to learn this. Uh, you have to know it because it gives you marks in an exam and it is a theory. All right, so here we go. What characteristics do we share with our primates, with the other primates? Well, think about it. We have an opposable thumb, okay? We have a thumb that can hold onto something. So if I take my juice bottle, all right, okay, I can take my hand and I can put it around this bottle. It's an opposable thumb. It works separately from the fingers. Guess what? Chimps and gorillas and monkeys and baboons and all the primates have exactly the same thing. They've got an opposable thumb. This is an opposable thumb. All right, so we can grip things. We've got bare fingertips and so do they. All right, well, I don't know. Hey, I've seen some guys that are quite hairy, eh, Ty? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so you, <laughs> we've got... I'd consider yeah. myself very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know guys like that, so I'm just like... Mm. Uh, do you remember that? What was that movie? <laughs> um, the 40-year-old... Virgin. Virgin. <laughs> And when, when, they, when his mates take him to have his hair removed. Oh, my goodness. Do you remember that? And he takes his shirt off and he's, he's like, like a werewolf. He's it? like <laughs> a werewolf, yeah. Okay, so people, here we go. Bare fingertips. Uh, we can feel because our sense of touch is here in our fingers. You know that your tongue is more sensitive, by the way. But your chimp's the same. Your primate's the same. Oh, bare fingertips. Okay, so they've got a better sense of touch, just like us. Um, long arms. If you take our arms compared to a bird, okay, or um, a penguin or a dolphin, uh, we've got long arms, and so do they. And, I mean, if we walked around on all fours, we could actually quite do it quite happily um, because our arms are nice and long. The thing is, our necks would get a bit sore, and you'd have to go to the chiropractor every week to have our necks sorted out because you'd be sitting doing this. All right, but we've got long arms. So do they. We have freely rotating arms. Look at this. Our arm freely rotates, and so does a chimp. Have you watched chimpanzees or gorillas um, at a zoo? The things that they can do, I mean, they, they are very acrobatic and energetic, and, and they can do all kinds of things but their movement of their sockets are exactly the same as ours, and the movement of their bones exactly the same as ours, right? Um, they can move their wrists with joints, and they're able to rotate it to 180 degrees, just like us. So here I found a picture of a guy, and this is the filmexperience.net. It was actually very cute, with the guy sitting there, and he's got this little chimp that he's busy teaching things to. Very, very, very sweet. Okay. Then we look at the characteristics, further characteristics. We have, now this is important. We have stereoscopic vision. Stereo means two. How many eyes do you have? You have two. How many eyes does a chimpanzee have? Two. So stereoscopic vision, which means we can judge depth, same as they do. Visual acuity, now if we talk about visual acuity, we're looking at rod and cone cells and the fact that we can see color. And your chimps and your primates can as well. Okay, so instead of thinking primate every time, think of a chimpanzee man. And, and the next time you go to, the, if you've got nothing to do on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday, or even during the school holidays that are coming up, go and take a trip to the zoo, a zoo near you. Just go and have a look at those animals. They are just too gorgeous. 
And, you know, that, that's why people can want to take them and, and mother them and, and, and sort of adopt them. Which is also a very bad idea because you will be arrested <laughs> if you step so from you the zoo. You will be arrested, <laughs> especially if you take it from the zoo. <laughs> but, it's, I mean, you can understand where movies like Gorillas in the Mist and those kind of movies come from because we can relate so closely because they are just so such awesome, incredible characters. Okay, so they can also see... And here I've got a nice picture of a gorilla. And here I've got a picture of a very pretty girl. This is my daughter, by the way. It's my baby. All right. So, but I mean, if you look at the eyes, look where our eyes sit. And look at the gorilla's eyes. Look where his eyes are. They're in the front. We can see we've got two eyes, stereoscopic vision. And we have rod and cone cells so we can actually see in color. And yes, Tide is my daughter. Yes, I'm just not sure she'd be flattered you were comparing her to gorilla. No, no, I was showing a perfect <laughs> human being and a gorilla. Mm. Hmm. Perfect human being. <laughs> All right. Then, um, yeah, that's, a, that's about as far as I'm going to go with that one. So, oh, what I did want to do is we have a large brain compared to m a, a, a body mass, large brain center. We can touch. We have an olfactory cell, which is a, 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 a um, sense which is reduced. Now, this here is the differences and where we are so much better than primates. That's the differences between humans versus primates. So what's different? We have a much larger brain. We have brain centers that can, imp that, that can uh, um, process information. So and we process information um, in, in a, a, a far more logical and easier to understand way. We can communicate, they can't. Okay? Olfactory s is reduced. For us, it's reduced. We don't smell as well as animals do. Why? Because you've got all these perfumes and stuff that we wear all the time. We live in, in, in pollution. So our sense of smell has become totally desensitized as well. So it's even worse now than maybe three, four hundred years ago when there wasn't this amount of pollution. But we still have a far reduced sense of smell to any primate. Okay? Um, we have few offspring, okay, and a longer gestation period. We have an upright posture, although I, I don't know, I don't stand upright too often. So you have upright posture, and we are bipedal. Bi means two, pedal means feet. So bipedalism, two feet, and we stand up straight, whereas they don't. They're hunched over. They can sit up straight, but they've still got that, that sort of, I mean, think of a gorilla. It's that sort of look. Why? Because their head is, is designed to fit onto their spine while they are on all fours. And they, aren't, they, 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 aren't, they don't stand up. They will stand up when they're going to fight but they don't just walk around upright or bipedal. And then also the social dependency. Um, we need cohesion. And they say, no man is an island unto himself, is, yes. a, is a good old English saying, because we need other people and we need social interaction, the same as, as your, um, your primates. No, what are you doing now? Okay, and here's just a picture on social interaction. Here they've got a piece of bread or something that someone's given them, and they're sort of looking at it and very enthusiastic about it. Okay, that make us different from other primates. We are bipedal. We walk on two legs. Um, we have a face and a skull that's flat. So if you look at our face, the face is flat. We don't have the protruding jaw and the receded headline over here. So that's very important. Um, oh, that's just a picture showing where the... See here, you've got the foramen magnum sits there. Oh, you're not going to see that. Um, the foramen magnum sits right in the middle of the, the skull. Okay, so that the, because we are upright and we are bipedal, two legs, here they... Are, are on their arms, hands and feet, and look at the angle here at which the, um, the spine fuses with the head or joins with the head. Some other differences that we have is indentation, our teeth, 
okay? They have smaller canines, we have smaller canines at least, um, because we don't need to rip flesh. Remember, they are omnivores, they need to rip flesh. We have a wonderfully gentle U shape in our mouths. They have a very square shape in their teeth. We have a larger brain, um, and we are able to communicate with language. We can talk. Um, and no matter how hard anyone's tried, they can claim that, that chimpanzees and gorillas and, and all the primates are so intelligent. Uh, yes, they are for animals, but they don't even come close to human beings, and they never will. Right. So we don't have to worry about Planet of the Apes and all these other movies that are out. That yes, are that are just out there to scare kids. It, it, <laughs> it, but it, it's, it's damn scary. I mean, mm. you see these until it's like they're all on concerta or something. Mm. Okay, what other question have we got there? We have actually from one from Martin Martin. He wanted to find out, I know this is a bit off, but he wanted to find out, um, it's like a two-headed question kind of thing. Because he wanted to find out, an organ what is an organism which carries an introduced gene? Hmm. And? Mm -hmm. and then he also wanted to find out why South Africa proud of the creator of mankind. I wanted to explain to him, but I was like, you know, I'd better just do it on air. Oi. <coughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Deep breath. <laughs> All right. Um, why are we so proud of the cradle of humankind? Because you don't just go around finding um, bits and pieces of organisms that lived a very long time ago. Okay, so we have found an incredible amount of fossils in South Africa and a concentrated number of them at the cradle of humankind. And it's something that, that any country can boast about, they can be proud of, because we've got scientists and archaeologists who've actually gone to the effort of looking at these things, looking for them and uncovering them. And it gives us some idea of where we come from and what our history is behind that. Okay, so that, that is something that's really special. And if you look at the different organisms that they have found, um, just while I'm on that, is that they look at dating. So they look at relative dating, and then they look at realistic dating. So your relative dating would be where this fossil is found within a rock structure. And they can say, well, hang on, this rock structure is about, I don't know, two million years old because of all the different layers that are on it um, and therefore if it's found like halfway down it's got to be like a million years old but you've also got to remember for any fossil to be made they have to be suit the, the conditions must be perfect um, you've also got to have an area where the animals aren't going to eat this poor organism. You've also got to make sure that there's a layer of silt that, that sort of comes as a powder dust over the organism and then goes layer for layer until the organism is now perfectly preserved. So it, it, it's not, you don't just have a fossil and there it is, yay, or a body and, and a human that's been preserved. It doesn't just happen like that um, because animals come along and the scavengers come along and they carry bones away. So, you know, to find something, it's, it's, it's normally when, they've been, when there's been a flood and you've got the silt and the silt then settles and it rots the flesh off so the bones remain intact and then layer upon layer and that like compresses it and then you've got this perfect little body that's found there. Um, with regards to just going to the, the, the cradle of mankind, humankind, uh, mankind, humankind, womankind, all of us people kind. Um, people, please make sure that you understand and know how to write about um, mitochondrial Eve and what the theory is behind mitochondrial Eve. It's very important. And then also the different famous um, uh, fossils that have been found. Like, for example, Littlefoot and Lucy and Mrs. Place and those. Make sure you know who found them. In fact, I think I've got them here. Let's just have a look. Um, man, come, come. Here's the cradle of humankind. So you've got your different... Oh, here we go. We've got the Turing child. Make sure that you know who found it, where it was found, when... When is not so important, but just what it is. So you've got your Astropithecus, um, and why was it relevant? And then you've got, come, come, come. We've got Lucy, and we've got Littlefoot, and we've got uh, Mrs. Pless, and then just these type of things that 
they're not going to ask you to recite or to feed back in a question. What they may do is give you a question on this and say to you, okay, what is this fossil? Why was it relevant? Um, what's so special about Australopithecus, um, Africanus versus this versus that? Why would we say it was the missing link? Why are there so few missing links? Um, is this a theory? Is it real? You know, that kind of thing. They'll ask you questions on it. So you don't have to know the stuff off by heart. You're going to know about it. All right. And I think we do for a... Yeah, for a little break. Oh, please. So on that note, so guys, make sure while we're doing our link and learning about the missing link, huh, get that... <laughs> anyway, <laughs> guys, make sure you don't go anywhere. Make sure you stay tuned and make sure you guys come back after this break. We'll see you soon. Welcome back, Mindsetters. I hope you had a nice little break. You guys went and got your snacks and whatever you needed. And you got yourself a hot cup of something that's warm so it keeps you warm because winter is cold. So guys, make sure, make sure, make sure you're nice and warm, you're wrapped up, but you make sure that you get on the page and get chatting to us. Doesn't mean that your fingers are frozen now. Make sure, make sure, make sure you keep speaking to me so I can make sure I speak to Kathy so we guys can actually help you out because guys, I really need to get these off my hands. So make sure, make sure you guys keep posting on the page because these will go to the people who post the most, who chat the most, who are out to help everyone else out. So guys, if you, ha if you can, make sure, make sure you guys ch chat to each other. And right now, I'm going to hand over to Kathy. Kathy, take it away. Thank you, doll. Okay, people, paper two, John is going to post onto Facebook exactly what you need to know for paper two. But just as a brief sort of like cover up or, or cover over it, um, paper 2, looking at life processes. Those life processes are going to be your nervous system, or <laughs> nervous system, endocrine system, which is chemical coordination, and then the eye and the ear. Okay, make sure you know them, learn them, learn your diagrams. If you know your diagrams, and you can then put on structure versus function, you are going to be perfect. And then population dynamics. Now, we haven't done population dynamics for you here. There is population dynamics, the clips that we have um, at Learn Extra. So if you go on to Learn Extra, it's what we've recorded or pre-recorded, and we will be showing it to you during the holiday and during the winter program. But with population dynamics, I haven't received any questions on population dynamics. And if I was just a betting person, I would give you a question on population dynamics around um, sampling, for example. Um, or looking at Peterson's index and how that works, um, and the different types of graphs. So your geometric graph with versus your lag, uh, uh, versus your logistic growth graph. Those kind of things I would be asking you. Um, so if you need help with that, please just just. Uh, most of you have done paper one already. You're heading for paper two. So maybe we should focus on paper two. I don't know what you don't know. And I don't know what you'd like me to go through. So what have we got there, Ty? Anybody asking anything specific? Um, there was a quick question from Shalom. He wanted to act, I think she. Um, is population dynamics population ecology? Yes. OK, that was a simple. Okay. <laughs> population, <laughs> listen people, population dynamics, population ecology. Population dynamics is the changes that take place within a population as far as numbers are concerned. Okay, population ecology, well you chuck in a little bit of ecology there as well. So it's just different terminology, but it's the same thing. All right. Um, there we mm. go. And, and then we had one from Yvonne. She wanted to find out, please can you explain how sim sympratic? Speci speciation uh, takes place. So mm. Okay. Sympatric and allopatric speciation mean exactly the same thing. It means that you have one species that's, and, and the species, parts of the species get split. All right, so now we have two species that are identical, and then one of them changes, it mutates. Mutations change that organism so that after a whole number of years, when you look at the two, this one has now formed a brand new species. 
So you start off with A, A splits, so we end up with A and B, and B becomes so different that they can no longer reproduce with A. Right, so th that is speciation. A new species has been created. Now we get two types. You get sympatric and allopatric speciation. The difference between the two is that with sympatric, there is a physical barrier. And with allopatric, mm, no. See, even I'm getting confused here. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Allopatric, there is a physical barrier. Sorry, people. And the way to remember it is if there is an allo in your path, you know what an allo is, it's a thing with thorns. If there's an allo in your path, you have to walk around it. Okay? So as you walk around that allo, it's an obstacle. So remember, allopatric, there is an obstacle. With sympatric, there is no physical barrier. So your physical barrier would be, for example, seawater. So you have an island and an island, and there's a whole bunch of seawater in between. Um, or the Grand Canyon, you've got a, a, a mountain ridge that's in between. Um, so they, there is an actual geological, physical geological barrier, which then creates or separates the, the organisms or individuals within a species. All right. So allopatric. Physical barrier, sympatric, if there's no physical barrier, but the organisms change anyway. Okay, anything else? Yes, there's a, but now there's a bit of a toss-up between nervous system and genetic engineering. Mm. Genetic engineering is not in paper two, so let's stick okay. to paper two. All so right, so nervous system. Okay. Um, all right. Mm, that was from Lorraine. She was insisting. She even posted three times. <laughs> what does she want on the nervous system? Um, Lorraine, just be specific, okay? Mm. I'm going to start off, but I need for you to be specific what it is you want because we've got like 12 minutes, guy, uh, uh, hun, so, so come, give it to us. All right, if we look at the nervous system, we have three nervous systems, okay? Three. And how do we work them? We say, right, we start off with the central nervous system. And the central nervous system... I'm doing in yellow, okay? It is the brain and the spinal cord. And it's not very hard because it's in the center of your body. Brain, spinal cord, central nervous system, okay? Then we have our second nervous system. And the second nervous system is the peripheral nervous system. And this we're doing in purple, okay? The peripheral nervous system is your eyes, nose, mouth, skin, in other words, all your senses. All your senses will form your peripheral nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system will take information and it will feed that information to the spinal cord and to the brain. Okay? So that's your peripheral nervous system. And then we have last, but definitely not least, we have the autonomic nervous system. And that we're putting in green. Okay? Your autonomic nervous system... is made up of two parts. It's made up of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So you've got the sympathetic autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system works on all your organs. So anything and everything that is not controlled by will 
and it is all your organs. So your heart, your lungs, your, your stomach, your liver, they all work without you thinking about it. So your autonomic nervous system controls all your organs and your sympathetic will stimulate an organ to work faster and the parasympathetic nervous system will cause it to relax or become inhibited. Okay, now just think, para means to sleep. That's why if someone is a para, they are paralytically drunk, they are pass out drunk. Um, if they are a paraplegic, it means that the body is not working. It's sleeping. So para means to sleep. Okay, so a, a, a parasympathetic, it is the one that's snoozing. It's the one that relaxes you. It's the one that chills your body out. It's the one that makes you not as active. Okay? Sympathetic will stimulate. When you're cold, your sympathetic nervous system is stimulated. That's why you start to shiver and shake. Whereas when you are hot and you are bothered and you are just chilling and you want to just cool down, it will be your parasympathetic that will kick in. Right, so that's your basics. Central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system, all your sense organs. And then autonomic, everything that works without you thinking about it. Now if we look at the basics, we start off with a receptor. And your receptors will be, you have internal receptors and external receptors. Your external receptors will be your five senses. Um, your internal receptors will be receptors that will monitor pH balance of your blood. It monitor, monitors the amount of oxygen in your blood. It monitors the amount of water in your blood. It monitors the amount of mineral salts and nutrients in your blood. Um, so in other words, it's everything that's going to make sure your tissue fluid is perfect and all the levels are correct. The minute there are changes, that information goes via the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system that tells the brain, oi, you need to sort things out. Which part of the brain? The hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus says, hmm, hold on. Uh, gorgeous girl walking past. Uh, heart rate increases, breathing rate increases, pupils dilate a little bit, and ooh, good looking girl. That's what happens. And it's all because of the hypothalamus. Okay, that little flip of a heart, girls, when you see the guy that you are so in love with that you want to die for, all right, you see him and you get that, or your boyfriend phones and you see his name on your phone and you think, oh, that oh, feeling, that little flip of the tummy, uh, the butterflies in the tummy, that's all because of adrenaline and adrenaline because of the hypothalamus. Okay, and that little adrenaline, that little butterfly feeling is as the blood vessels around your stomach are constricting, by the way. Not a good thing. Okay, but, but we like it. <laughs> Any other questions there? Yes. Um, okay, there's another toss-up between doing the genetic diagrams to interpret the pedigree um, diagram or the nervous coordination versus chemical coordination. Genetics, genetics. Genetics is paper one. Is it? Because mm -hmm. mm, I think, yeah, because there's also been a quest because some I also aren't really, I haven't I written don't paper one yet. What, people, are you, have you all written paper one? Are some of you still writing paper one? Because then we need to do the genetics. Mm. Um, just give me those questions again. Okay, so Ryan wants to find out um, how to interpret the pedigree diagram. Okay. Mm. And right. then Mpumla wants to find out about the nervous coordination versus chemical coordination. Nervous cord versus ca okay. Hang on, let's do that one first. Okay, if we go nervous cord versus chemical cord. Okay, nervous coordination is because be through and because of your three nervous systems. So nervous coordination is as a result of a collaborative work teamwork between the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system. The three of them work together. But part of your central nervous system that links to your autonomic nervous system is the hypothalamus. 
okay? The hypothalamus controls the, the pituitary gland. And guess what? The pituitary gland is called the master gland. And the pituitary gland controls chemical coordination. So what does that tell you? It tells you that actually the hypothalamus controls the chemical coordination. And that the, that the chemical coordination and nervous coordination work hand in glove. Because your chemicals can tell the organs what to do through hormones released by endocrine glands, which are ductless, so the hormone is released directly into the blood. Okay? How, why, where, when? Because the pituitary is the master gland, and the pituitary gets its instructions from the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus controls the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Because it is the hypothalamus that, through the medulla oblongata, will control your heartbeat rate, your breathing rate, your sex drive, your need for sleep, your appetite, all of it. All your basic physical functions are controlled by the hypothalamus through the medulla oblongata. So that is how chemical coordination and nervous coordination work hand in glove. Okay, next question was, it was? The yes, it was about the pedigree, pedigree diagram. Pedigree chart. Okay, people, if you look here. Okay, when, can John, 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 uh, please, I wish, I hope, let's just see what we've got here for grade 12. No, no, no. Okay, um, let me go back here so I've got my blank space. Okay. Um, a pedigree chart. All right. Uh, if we do for a break in about three or four minutes' time, I'm going to ask John to load a pedigree chart so that I can quickly show you what the pedigree chart looks like. So give us another question in the meantime. Okay. Um, let me scan. Yes, there was also another request on the endocrine system. Mm, okay. In, just, just briefly. With the endocrine system, you take that diagram of, we, and we've posted it, we posted it two weeks ago, I think, and you'll, you, if you go on to learn extra, you'll find it, okay? You take the diagram of the little man with all the endocrine glands marked on it. Make sure that you draw yourself a table, which is also there, and take that table and then learn what the gland is, what hormone it secretes, where it is situated, and where the target organ is. Okay, so for example, <coughs> you'll say pituitary gland. We're going to look at the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, and the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland is going to release all the different hormones. You look at the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Let's take one, um, antidiuretic hormone. And ADH will then travel in the blood, and what's the target organ? The target organ is going to be the kidneys. Why? Because it causes the reabsorption of water. <coughs> Make sure you know the table of hot and cold day, for example. So you've got that sorted. Um, then you go to your next hormone. Let's say um, the pancreas. So the pancreas, where it's located, well, it's, it's just a, it's, it, it connects to the duodenum, all right, of the small intestine. What does it release? It releases insulin and glucagon. You'll find a whole little schematic in the Learn Extra notes, okay? So print them out, and, and that's what you need to know. It also gives you all your definitions. So you have to know insulin versus glucagon. Insulin, what does it do? It inhibits the re release of glucagon, but it causes the liver and the muscle cells to convert glucose to glycogen and store it. And that lowers the blood sugar. Glucagon is released like first thing in the morning when you're waking up and it says, oh, I'm dead. And say, no, no, no. Let's release glucagon to give us some energy. So glucagon, what does it do? Goes into the blood. All right. Also released by the pancreas, goes into the blood. And where does it go? It goes to the target organ, the liver and the muscle cells. And says, hey, guys, we haven't got enough sugar here, man. Give us some energy. And what happens? The liver and the muscle cells will convert glycogen, stored glucose, into glucose and lift your blood sugar up. Okay, if it happens quicker, then it means that you're a morning person. If it happens slower, it means you're not a morning person. All right. Okay, I think and we're going to take a bit of a break, and yes. then while we put a pedigree chart up. 
Yes, that's what I think we should do. So guys, make sure you don't go anywhere. Make sure you stick around. Make sure you have your pens and pads out and you guys are still writing notes because we're going to be covering a lot. So make sure, make sure, make sure you stick around and we're going to see you after this break. Okay, welcome back, Mindsetters. I just got information from my awesome, awesome, awesome producer. She's an awesome person, and I think she's absolutely awesome, because she's awesome. <laughs> and then, so guys, 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 I cannot stress enough. Make sure you get on the page, get chatting to us. I know there's a lot of you who were chatting, but make sure you guys talk amongst each other. That's why the page is there. But now, I'm going to hand back to Kathy. Kathy, take it away. Okay, people. Uh, we, uh, th th we're battling here. Th this is technology. It's like those little gremlins, you know. A as I said to you, technology, computers, they are all male, right? And, and I'm not being sexist either. They only do what you tell them to do. All right, so now, pedigree chart. What they'll do is they'll say to you, right, um, circles are mommies and squares are daddies, okay? So circle plus square, okay? And circle plus square ha have a whole bunch of bubbas. Okay? So let's make them have four babies. So let's say they have two daughters and they have two sons. And this will all be in my key. So a circle is female and a square is male. Okay? All right. Now we, we'll think of a characteristic now. And then... Um, another family, you'll have mommy and you'll have daddy, and the two of them have a baby. They just have two. They have a son and a daughter, so they have a perfect little pigeon pair. Well, no, let's do it this way around. We have a circle and so a, a daughter and a son, and then these two get together, and they have a whole bunch of kids as well, and everybody lives happily ever after. So let's say they have two daughters and a son. Well, I don't know why, because boys are easier to raise than girls are. Okay, now, um, let's do this. Let's say we have mommy and daddy, and mommy and daddy have child, and here we only have one, and this child... And I'm really playing it here, but okay. I just want to show you the basics of a pie chart. So, I mean, a thing. And then they have a baby, which is... Um, and they will have a child here. Okay. So, and I've just done this at random. So, what we have to do now is we have to look at our dominant genes. Okay. And what is recessive. All right, so what is dominant? What is recessive? Just remember, complete dominance is when the dominant gene completely dominates over the recessive gene. Then we've got incomplete dominance. So the dominant gene doesn't completely dominate over the recessive gene. So if the dominant gene is red and the recessive gene is white, we end up with pink. It's sort of like a mixture of the two because they don't dominate. And then we get co-dominance, where, for example, in blood, blood group A, blood group B, and you mix the two, you get AB. They multiple alleles. It means there's more than one, uh, two alleles for a characteristic. So it becomes multiple alleles, and we end up then with them both being dominant. So in the case of color, we'll have a flower that's red and a flower that's white, and you'll end up with a flower that's red with white markings on it. There is, no, there is co dominance, they both dominate. Incomplete, you have a mixture, so you end up with pink. Okay, so what we have here, um, let's say this was hair color. So dominant would be brown, and um, recessive would be blonde. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a look at our parents, and we, okay, so. This would be capital B, would be show that it's dominant, and a small b would show that it is recessive. So if we look here, we don't know what any of these are, because I'm not going to give it to you. Normally, you would get it in a key. In this case, we're going to work it out. So we say, okay, uh, we don't know what they are. But now, if we look at these two, 
They have two children that look like that, but they also have children that don't have the dominant trait. So, okay, what we'll say here is that if it is shaded, whether it's a circle or a thing, if it is shaded, it's dominant, and if it is blank, it is recessive. Okay, so let's see if it works. These are both dominant because they're shaded. But they produce babies that are recessive. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark all the recessives first. Okay? So if it's blank, it's recessive. So we know that this is little b, little b. That is little b, little b. And this is how you do any uh, uh, um, chart like this. You always mark off first all the recessive babies. So there we go. Small b, small b, small b, small b. Now we know what they are. Now if we look here, in order for this baby to even be here and that one to be there, we must have one b from mommy and one from daddy. Which means daddy is not shaded, so therefore daddy is recessive. So therefore mom must be a capital B, small b. Otherwise where did this little b come from? You follow? So mom must be heterozygous, a mixture. Um, okay, now we go up and we say, okay. This one here produces two babies that are uh, uh, um, dark, which means that we have to have this one is either capital B, small b, or capital B, capital B. It doesn't matter. But this female here is either that or that. Why? Because they end up with babies that both have the capital. Um, at least they only need one capital letter. So one capital letter must come from the mother. We also know that it's shaded. And if it's shaded, it has to have the, the, the dominant gene or the dominant trait. So there we go with that one. Now, what are these babies here? These two... Um, what are we going to have? Oh, sorry, but I just want to do this one here. This one here can only ever be heterozygous. Why? Because it's only ever going to get a little recessive gene from the, from the father. The mother is where it's getting its, its capital letter from, and the father we know is homozygous recessive. So there's those two. Now, what do we do here? The fact that these two have produced the babies that are recessive, a little b had to come from there, and a little b had to come from there to make these two, that baby there, and to make this baby there. All right, but remember, every single time reproduction takes place, how are we going for time here? I think we've got about six minutes. Okay, um, every time a baby is produced, and the female produces an egg, and the male produces his sperm, all right, every single time, there are four combinations of what that baby can be like. So you can end up with four children that are all different or four children where three are the same and one is different. It's every single time there is a crossing over and during fertilization, you end up with those same four chances happening. That is why the closest any parent can be to a match for an organ donation to their child is 50%. Because 50% came from mom and 50% came from dad. Um, but it's which combinations. So sisters, your siblings, your brothers and sisters are normally the better organ donors. All right, so going back here. But these two are dark. They shaded. Uh, they shaded, so they must be heterozygous. Why? Because they both had a little b. <coughs> Otherwise, these babies couldn't have been. These babies here, however, can either be capital B, um, or they can be capital B, small b. And that is how you do your pedigree chart. If you get a pedigree chart in an exam, you say, uh-huh, this is perfect because they've given me all my information here. And all you have to do is look at the key. What does the key tell you? It tells you which are female and which are male. So circles, squares, which is male, which is female. Okay, and then... They'll turn around and say to you, right, if they're shaded, it's this, and if they're unshaded, it's that. They do it for tongue rolling. Mm. 
versus people that can't roll their tongues. Um, they'll do it with earlobes, whether the earlobes curl up or whether the earlobes go in. They'll do it with a comb on a chicken's head, uh, a cock's head. All right? Some of them are going to have a comb and some don't. What is dominant? What is recessive? Don't always assume that black or brown is dominant over white or blonde as recessive because what's your question? They can turn it around. Generally, we write, and they did this in one of, I think it was last year's final exam, which really irked me because it was damn unfair, is that we normally write our, if it's a recessive gene, recessive, if it's recessive, we write it with, with lowercase. So in other words, blonde or white, whatever, we'll write as little b, little b. That should be homozygous. Homozygous meaning pure for the recessive gene. Okay, if it is dominant, okay, we write it in uppercase. So in other words, in capitals. And that's what we use to indicate that something is dominant. So either um, black, brown, the dominant color. Okay, And what they did in the exam is they said, OK, I can't remember what exactly it was, but let's say blonde, or hang on, it was white. We say that white, which is recessive, it's recessive, they tell you that, okay, but you write it with a capital W, okay, in your cross. And black was um, dominant, and you had to write that with a capital B. So instead of having capital B, small b's, the kids were now working with capital B and capital W, and it threw them completely because they immediately assumed this had to be a, a small one. So people, just read your question carefully. Look at what they're telling you. And you work on what is dominant versus recessive. And you work on what is male versus female. And what they tell you is dominant and recessive. Read your questions very carefully and think before you ink. All right, don't just, ah, oh, and jump off the deep end. And if you're doing essays, take that essay to pieces. Have a look at exactly what they're asking you. And that is what you answer in an essay form. All right, do your multi-choices and your short questions last? You start off with your long questions, then your essay, then your short questions, and you do your multi-choice last. If you run out of time, you just write D or B all the way down. And at least you have a 25% chance, even though you didn't even look at the questions. Okay, don't waste time. Okay, so guys, 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 I know, I know a lot of you are crying like, no, there's things you need to cover, but um, guys, I'm sorry, we wish, we wish we could like extend the hours and okay, make sure... Okay, is there anything, what other questions have we got here? Maybe um, there's something I can answer quick, quick. There is one um, by Linda Kille, she's been dying to find out, okay, just um, if you could go over Down syndrome, explain what occurs okay. and how it happens. Down syndrome, Down syndrome is when the female's egg does not split evenly. So instead of having 23 chromosomes, and 23 chromosomes, it ends up splitting as 24 and 22. Okay, now if that 24 chromosome egg joins with a male sperm, which is 23, we now end up with 47 chromosomes instead of 46 because uh, a chromosome 21 should have two chromosomes and you end up with three chromosomes at 21. And that's what causes your Down syndrome child. They have 47 chromosomes, not okay. 46. So, yes. So, guys, I'm going to scour through this page and try and find the winners. And, guys, guys, again, good luck, good luck, good luck. And from us, we're going to see you next, no, after the holidays on the 16th of July. Goodbye. We'll see you next time. Bye.